22. Judgment as Process and Event When theology speaks of the Last Judgment, it thereby distinguishes the final event from all judgments preceding it. Very obviously, many previous judgments are presupposed by this language, and rightly so. The fall was a judgment, as was the flood. The conquest of Canaan was a judgment on the peoples of that land, and Israel's captivity, centuries later, was also a judgment. Judgment events are commonplace in history, and we live in a time of impending judgment. Supremely, of course. The cross of Christ and his resurrection were judgments on sin and death, a fact which makes clear another aspect of God's providence. The inseparable connection between judgment and salvation. Without judgment, there is no salvation. With the fall came the promise of the chosen seed, Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, and with every subsequent judgment there came salvation. The judgment of Egypt was the salvation of Israel, and the judgment upon Christ is our release from the slavery to sin and death. The judgment event recurs throughout history, in a variety of forms. Every time a child is spanked for wrongdoing, or whenever a criminal is punished for his crimes, we have a judgment event. History is a succession of judgment events, culminating in the last judgment. All other events are partial ones. The last judgment is final, absolute, and eternal in its consequences. On the other hand, many judgments of God are a process rather than an event. Because God created the heavens and the earth and all things therein, His law order is inherent to all His being, and also to all created being. As a result, God's law is not something external to my life, but far more basic to it than my own thoughts. To illustrate, a man may, in the context of his daily life, think about his work or future, daydream about things he would like, consider various sins he imagines would be profitable and beyond discovery, and so on. His consciousness harbours and exploits a wide variety of possibilities. All these are expressive of the heart and the life of the man. All, however, are capable of being changed by fear, conversion, other interests, and a variety of factors. What cannot be changed is the fact that he is God's creation and creature, and that every atom of his being has a law of God written into it. Paul makes this very clear in Romans chapter 1, verses 18 to 20. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them, for God hath showed it unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. God's wrath is against all man's sin and lawlessness. Men hold back, hinder, or suppress God's truth in unrighteousness or injustice. Hating God's justice, they seek to hinder or obliterate its testimony in them. God's anger is against them for their sin, their injustice and ungodliness, and because, having sinned, they compound it by denying the truth, or, at best, still holding it back or down. Their conduct is inexcusable, because God has both manifested his law in them and to them. All men everywhere have inherent in their being God's law. Romans chapter 2 verses 14 and 15. All men originally had, and in some sense continue to have, the witness of God's law to them, and this is most emphatically true of all who have been in the context of a Hebrew or a Christian culture. Hence, 
Paul emphasizes the fact that all men are without excuse. There is total justice to God's condemnation. Men choose death in preference to obedience to the triune God. Sin is not an accident. It is a willful preference for our way as against God's law. Of the knowledge of God, Hodge said, This knowledge is a revelation. It is the manifestation of God in his works and in the constitution of our nature. At this point, an aspect of verse 19 needs to be noted. God's nature, our duty, and the true knowledge of God himself reverberates in every fibre of our bodies and every atom of our being. There is, however, a creaturely limit to this knowledge. That which may be known of God is only that which a creature can grasp. Calvin commented on this, saying, Insane, then, are all they who seek to know of themselves what God is. To seek to know or prove God on our own, on autonomous and rational grounds, is to deny that our being is an inescapable witness to the knowledge of God. It is presumption. Not surprisingly, such presumption then seeks exhaustive knowledge of God and treats him as a creature to be examined, not revered. Thus, everything within and without, the visible universe and our own being, witnesses to God's power, nature and justice. Verse 20 When men despise this witness, they pervert their own lives and begin a burning out process, of which homosexuality is the culmination. Verses 21 to 32 They thus enter into the process of judgment, an inner disintegration and an outer life of evil crises brought on by their sin. Judgment as process is summed up by Solomon in these words. He that diggeth a pit shall fall into it, and whoso breaketh an hedge, a serpent shall bite him. Ecclesiastes chapter 10 verse 8. What Solomon has reference to is sinful activities. If we, by evil design, plan to entrap another man, we ourselves open up forces of entrapment for ourselves. If we try to break down the hedge of the law, out of the law of judgment comes forth to destroy us. All this is another way of saying that the wages of sin is death. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 Because all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1 verse 3 Any deflection of any segment of God's creation from God's law means that judgment comes upon the straying person or thing. St. Augustine said, Our hearts are restless until they rest in thee. Our very hearts condemn us, St. John makes clear, when we depart from him and his word. 1 John chapter 3, verses 20 and 21. Judgment as process is the inescapable concomitant of all creation and life. To be a creature is to be either in the process of judgment, judgment, however, is also an event. The reprobate blinds himself as best he can to the fact of judgment as process. He calls it a variety of names to disguise what is happening to him. That's life, or those are the odds, and like terms are used to attempt to separate morality from the processes of judgment. This is a little more difficult with judgment as an event, but it is still done. Malachi chapter 2 verse 17 tells us, Ye have wearied the Lord with your words. Yet ye say, Wherein have we wearied him? When ye say, Everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them. Or, Where is the God of judgment? 
The men of Judah knew of God's judgments in past history, but nullified them in their thinking. The fact that judgment as a great event was sporadic in history enabled them to discount the relevance of God to everyday history. If a man at best sees God as clobbering him once or twice in his life, but for the most part leaving him alone, it becomes easy for him to see life on largely autonomous terms. The remote God is then only occasionally involved in history. This is why it is necessary to affirm judgment as both process and event. To do so is to affirm that God has an overriding and governing purpose in every moment of time and every atom of the universe. Moreover, because there is a totality of judgment, there is a totality of salvation. That is, the whole creation is made new, the remnant of evil ones are separated from it, and the great processes and events of judgment culminate in the last judgment and the new creation. If we neglect process judgment, we fall into eschatologies of defeat. Then, only an outside judgment can salvage creation and rescue something out of it. With process judgment and event judgment, Christ reigns and puts all things under his feet. The end comes when all rule and all authority and power are in Christ, and all his enemies trampled and destroyed. Then comes the end, and the destruction of the last enemy, death. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 24 to 26. Judgment as process has been neglected because of the influence of deism. Too often the church, enforcing heresy and evil, retreats to a lowest common denominator position, or to the defence of, quote, essentials only, end quote. For man to rule that any aspect of God's revelation is non-essential means placing man in the judgment seat over God. Deism held to an absentee landlord God. In truth, God was simply a limiting concept for many deists who needed God only as the first cause and no more. It is notable that, while the church opposed deism, it was not unmarked by that battle. The doctrine of providence, so common to Reformation and Puritan thinking, receded into the background. The neglect of providence meant also the neglect of judgment as process, because the totally present and personal governments of God in history was thus downgraded and neglected. The providential activities of God were limited to pietistic experiences. The Lord kept the train waiting for me, even though I was late. When I looked at the meal, exactly what I needed had arrived, and so on. In other words, providence now existed for pietists to care for them personally, not to further God's total and cosmic rule. The pietists having lost interest in the world at large, assumed that God had also lost interest in everything except their souls. The result has been egocentric religion, not the providence of the triune God, for whom nothing is too great nor too small, nor anything that escapes his government and judgments.